This video was made possible by Squarespace. Hi guys, welcome to Amashor Chemistry. So in this video, I will be continuing the journey to make the legendary cubic molecule called cubane, or more precisely, it's 1,4-dicarboxylic acid methyl ester. If you want to know more about cubane, I highly advise you to watch the first video of this series, where I talk about it as well as its whole synthesis in detail, and in this video, I pick up right where I left off previously, and what I have to do now is brominate my cyclopentanone ethylene ketal, and then make this weird looking molecule from it, which will allow me to later make my precious cubane using some really cursed chemistry. Also, in the previous video, I said that in this one I will be going all the way to this molecule, but I severely underestimated just how much work these two reactions require, so I decided that I will just focus on them and leave the other one for the next video. Anyway, for the bromination, I will of course need bromine, and I have to use a really large amount of it here, which is a little problematic, because it's really hard to produce bromine in large quantities. Fortunately, I found a method that makes this possible, and if you want to see it more in depth, I recommend you watch my video on bromine. I actually made it just because of this project, and I ended up producing around 380 grams of very pure bromine, which looks just magical. With the reagents for the bromination ready, I have to take care of the solvent, and this is where things get a bit tricky. You see, I can't just use any random solvent, and I specifically have to use one called dioxane, and that's because it is the only one that works for this reaction. The reason for that is actually pretty complex, and I will explain it more in depth later, but what matters is that I need a lot of dioxane for this reaction, and it needs to be really pure. And I am not talking something like 98% pure here, the dioxane needs to be pretty much as pure as it gets, because otherwise it will completely screw up the reaction, and that means that I will have to use a really interesting purification method, but first I have to figure out how can I get my hands on it. Dioxane can be made from ethylene glycol, commonly found in antifreeze, but the thing with this method is that it all just turns into tar, and the produced dioxane is really dirty, so I had to buy it from a supplier. It turns out that it is really expensive, and after selling my kidney, I managed to get 3 small bottles of it, and they all claim that the dioxane is pure, but I didn't really trust them, and began the purification. I poured 630 ml of the dioxane into my new and shiny 1 liter boiling flask, which roughly corresponds to how much I will need later, and now it was time to add the cleaning agent, which in this case will be pure sodium metal. However, before I add it, I need to tell you about the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. Squarespace is an advanced all-in-one website creation platform designed to make entrepreneurs stand out and succeed online. Squarespace allows you to create beautiful websites with ease, whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand, and use them to engage with your audience or sell anything from products to your time. Squarespace offers a variety of features like their flexible website templates that I personally think are amazing and allow you to really turn your website idea into reality. Squarespace also allows you to engage with your audience through email campaigns, which are an amazing way to drive sales and build connections. Also, their incredible blogging tools allow you to easily share stories and photos or videos with your audience, which is a really useful feature that I myself really enjoy. For a free trial, head to squarespace.com and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash amateurchemistry to save 10% off your first purchase. Anyway, as I said, I will use sodium metal as a purifying agent, because it is extremely reactive and perfect for destroying impurities. To start, I got my sodium metal container, which is this bottle with paraffin oil in it to keep the sodium from reacting with the air, and got all of the sodium out of it onto a paper towel, which proved to be a bit tricky, and when I was done, it was now time to cut it into smaller pieces to give it more surface area. To do this, I got a kitchen knife, which cut the sodium like it was butter, leaving me with some nice and small pieces of it. To start the purification process, I added them to the dioxane, and as an indicator of when the dioxane is pure, I added a few crystals of a chemical called benzophenone, which should turn blue when all the impurities are destroyed, indicating the end of the reaction. As you can see, even at room temperature, the sodium reacts with some impurities, producing hydrogen gas, and to speed this up, I assembled a reflux apparatus and started heating the flask. 
After some time, the reaction became more vigorous, producing some white insoluble junk, which was expected. But then I blinked, and it all turned into this disgusting brown tar. I mean, I looked away from it for something like 3 minutes, and it just went ultra tar mode, which was really sad and kind of frustrating, but this is organic chemistry, and that means that it has the right to tar up whenever it wants. Anyway, jokes aside, all that tar means that the dioxin, despite being supposedly pure, was actually really dirty, and it's good that I found this out during the purification, and not later in the bromination. I continued hitting the flask, and after some time, most of the tar sank to the bottom, the sodium also melted and turned into these little blobs, and when they stopped getting smaller, I concluded that the reaction was finished, and I couldn't count on my benzophenone, because it got obliterated by all that tar. To separate all the tar from the dioxane, I swapped the reflex for a distillation apparatus and started hitting the flask. The distillation went really smoothly and left me with some nice and this time very pure dioxane, along with this weird light brown solid, which was a pain to dispose of because of the residual sodium. Ok, and now with the dioxane ready, I can finally start the bromination, and before calculating how much of it or the kit I will need, I wanted to take a look at my bromine, which has been sitting in the safety contraption for a few days, because I wanted to see exactly how much I have. To do that, I freed the flask from all the tape and put it onto a scale. It turns out that they have 390 grams of bromine, which means that in total I made 27 grams more than I thought I had. I measured it like 10 times and calibrated the scale, but the amount always came out to be 390 grams, so it turns out that I made a mistake in the bromine video, and I'm really sorry for that. Fortunately, this means that I can run the reaction on a little larger scale, and I calculated that along with all the bromine, I will need 630 ml of dioxane and 101 grams of cyclopentanone ethylene ketal. I unfortunately was around 40 ml short on the dioxane, but since I'm working on a pretty large scale, I guess that it won't matter too much and just added all that I have into a flask. Also, because of the additional bromine, I had to use some more of the cyclopentanone ethylene ketal, so along with all of it from the bottle, I added in some from the analysis vial, so that the final amount equals 101 grams. I also set up an ice bath to cool things down and minimize side reactions and over the course of about an hour, I got the flask to around 80 degrees Celsius. I then swapped the thermometer for a pressure equalized dripping funnel, which I filled with all of my bromine, and when everything was ready, I lightly opened the valve and started adding the bromine in small drops. Immediately upon its addition, its color disappeared indicating that the reaction was progressing, I also had to use some very strong steering here to not create any local hotspots. Also guys, I was doing this on New Year's Eve, and I managed to capture the exact moment when the new year arrived, so happy new year everyone, and I wish you that all of your experiments succeed, as well as for the tar to leave you alone. Anyway, in terms of the reaction going on here, the bromine attacks the cyclopentanone ethylene ketal, brominating it and producing hydrogen bromide, which normally is a gas, but it gets dissolved into the dioxane. For making the cubane, I have to brominate the ketal in three places, and to do that I need to use three equivalents of molecular bromine, so for just 101 grams of the ketal, I had to use nearly 400 grams of bromine. Also, you are probably wondering why I specifically need to use dioxane here, because there are plenty of other solvents that are cheaper and don't have a tendency to go to the tar realm. Well, I have to use dioxane because it can actually form a complex with the bromine, which you can see depositing on the walls of the flask as these nice crystals, and this complex is necessary to brominate the ketal in the right places. There are actually a lot of really complicated reasons for that, but in short, this complex mostly attacks the ketal in just the places that I want it to, and if I were to use pure bromine without the dioxane, I would end up with just some tar of weird bromination products. Anyway, I continued adding the bromine at such a way that the mixture doesn't get too hot. I also didn't have a two-necked flask to know the mixture's exact temperature, so I just kinda eyeballed it, and frequently topped up the ice bath with more ice. The dioxin bromine complex also started forming these really nice red crystals on the end of the dripping funnel, and the mixture took on a light orange color from some unreacted bromine. When there was about a third of the bromine left in the additional funnel, I sped up its addition because it was already 4am, and after about an hour, all the bromine was now in the flask, and to ensure that all of it reacts, I left this thing to stir for 2 weeks. 
It's not because it needs so much time, but because I had to edit the first Cuban video which ended up being way bigger than I expected, and because I went on a trip to Egypt for a week and saw the Nile River on a sunrise, which means that I actually got to see Nile Red personally, as well as wrote the script for this video on a crappy laptop in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Anyway, when I came back the reaction mix looked much lighter, which was a really good sign and now I had to extract my product from it. I theoretically could not do it and just proceed to the next reaction straight away, but since this flask is already almost full and I don't have a bigger one, I decided that I won't risk anything and just go the safe route even if in the end I will have a worse yield. The extraction is supposed to be pretty straightforward and all that I have to do is extract my product with diethylether, wash it with a lot of different things and then distill off the solvent, but the problem is that I ran out of ether. A while ago I actually made some of it from vodka and I still have it but it's only a tiny amount contaminated with some potassium hydroxide and for the whole process I'm going to need tons of it so I sold my other kidney and brought this giant and slightly terrifying bottle of it. Ok so to begin the purification I poured 400 ml of a saturated sodium bicarbonate solution into a large beaker to neutralize all of the hydrogen bromide dissolving the dioxane. On top of that I also added 200 ml of the ether to pick up my product from the dioxane and started to slowly add around a third of my reaction mixture. Immediately upon its addition a lot of carbon dioxide bubbles were produced from the hydrogen bromide neutralization and this whole thing looked really pretty. However this is organic chemistry so of course everything quickly turned into red tar. I got the mixture into a separatory panel and the layers didn't really want to separate because they now have similar density since most of my product goes over to the ether making it slightly denser than the water layer. After about half an hour the layers finally separated so I joined them into separate beakers and repeated this process until no more of the mixture remained. I then repeated everything three times to process the whole bromination mix which took forever and I was now left with a ton of some nasty black dioxin containing water and some not much better diethylether containing my product. The water still contains some of the product and to extract it I washed it all with some more ether and when that was done I combined all of the ether extracts and washed them with some saturated sodium bicarbonate solution to make sure that all of the hydrogen bromide is gone. I then washed the ether with a 10% sodium thiosulfate solution to neutralize the excess bromine and finally I washed everything with a saturated sodium chloride solution to dry it and pick up any water soluble impurities. I also got rid of any remaining water using anhydrous sodium sulfate which made the ether look like some nice and clear pee. All of these washing steps took me almost a week and occupy a whopping 25 gigabytes of space on my hard drive and now I can finally start isolating my product. I first have to remove the solvent so I set everything up for distillation. The ether started distilling over incredibly quickly thanks to its low boiling point and when most of it was gone I started collecting some dioxane which was still there even after all the washing steps. It had a really hard time coming over and I didn't manage to get it out to come through but this shouldn't be a big problem and now after disassembling the apparatus it is time to finally crystallize out my product. It is now dissolved in the leftover dioxane making it look like pure tar and to get it out I got the flask into an ice bath and scraped its bottom with a thermometer which made some very crude crystals appear and to start cleaning them up I added in some ethanol and heated everything up to dissolve the crystals. The ethanol as well as a lot of other reagents for the synthesis were supplied by an online chemistry supply shop BM Chemistry. BM Chemistry sells a lot of hard to get reagents along with laboratory equipment and lots of other things so you can check out their page to which there is a link in the description. Anyway when everything dissolved I put the flask into a freezer overnight and when I came back there were some real nice crystals of my product deposited on its bottom. To start cleaning them I first broke them apart with a glass rod and then vacuum filtered them. In the end I was left with some brown crystals which were still a little too dirty for my standards so I decided to recrystallize them but before that I wanted to recover some more of them from the filtrate. To do that I quickly evaporated most of the solvent using vacuum distillation but it turns out that I heated my product a little too much because in the end I was left with just pure elemental tar that didn't turn into any crystals which was just sad. Fortunately I still have a lot of my product and now to clean it up I dissolved it all in some boiling ethanol and cooled this mixture down in a freezer. I then vacuum filtered and dried the crystals leaving me with some really nice and slightly brown product. 
When it comes to the yield, I managed to make 131.78 grams of the 225 tribromo cyclopentanone ethylene ketal, corresponding to a percent yield of 46%, which isn't a lot, but considering all the washing steps and recrystallizations, this is rather acceptable. This step in the synthesis has been the hardest by far, including all the preparations, washings and recrystallizations, it took me 3 whole weeks, and thank god it's finally over. As always, I put some of the product into a vial for analysis, which makes the final amount equal 130 grams. Also, to check that I really have the product I want, I performed a crude melting point analysis, which told me that my product melts at around 72 degrees Celsius, and that is precisely how it should be, so it's really cool that after all this struggle, I managed to make some rather pure product. Anyway, now it's time for the fourth step in the overall synthesis, and that is the Dills Older reaction, which will join two molecules of the tribromoketal together to make this abomination, which will later allow me to make the cubane. You might think that such a reaction needs some really weird reagents or conditions, but apart from the ketal, it just needs some methanol and sodium hydroxide, which are very easy to get. To start, I added all of my tribromoketal into a 1 liter boiling flask along with 500 ml of methanol and 72 grams of sodium hydroxide and assembled a reflux apparatus on top of it. I then turned on the heating and steering, and after a while the tribromoketal melted and this weird precipitate of sodium bromide started to form. In terms of the reaction going on here, the sodium hydroxide strips off two bromines from the ketal, giving it two new double bonds which allow it to react with another molecule of itself, forming this big structure and shifting a double bond. This is a great example of the Dills Older reaction, which is really interesting and complex, but I won't get into too much detail on it here. What's important is that it is a textbook example of a chemical reaction happening in 3D, and that it's really useful for creating such complex molecules. It could also theoretically produce a stereoisomer of the product with a bromine atom on the other side, but it prefers to form the one I am looking for. Also, this molecule has a really long and complex name, so for simplicity, I will just call it the diketal. Anyway, the reaction's color got progressively lighter as time went on, and after 4 hours I turned off the heating and allowed everything to cool down. To get my product out of the slurry, I have to pour everything into a lot of cold water, which will dissolve all of the water-soluble impurities, leaving behind my product, which is insoluble in water, and to start, I set up this incredibly large salad bowl, and filled it with about 1.5 liters of distilled water. I then cooled everything using some cold packs, as well as some fancy distilled water ice, and with stirring, I began pouring in my reaction mix. The product did in fact precipitate out as this white sludge, and now I had to stir it to break it up into smaller pieces and clean off any remaining impurities. I however couldn't do that in the bowl because I don't nearly have a steel bar big enough for that, so I transferred everything into three large beakers, two of which I started to stir immediately on my hot plates, and I filtered off most of the water from the third one and added the product from it into the other beakers. After about an hour, I stopped the stirring, vacuum filtered and thoroughly washed all of the product, I also tried to dry it on the filter as much as I could, because now I have to completely dry it, and it is rather tricky, because despite being hydrophobic and insoluble in water, it can actually hold on to a lot of it, and to remove it completely, I have to use a vacuum. I transferred all of my wet product into this two-necked flask in a heating mantle, and then attached a vacuum line to it, covered it in aluminum foil, and started to lightly heat it. The vacuum allows the water to boil the temperature much lower than it normally does, and the heating makes it evaporate really fast, so after just a few minutes, I could see some water escaping into the vacuum line. To make the water come over faster, I tilted everything using a fresh container of 96% pure laboratory-grade iron-free chloride hexahydrate, and left this thing to run overnight. When I came back, the product was now a nice and dry powder, but it was still a little brown, so to clean it up, I quickly washed it with some ice cold ethanol, which picked up a lot of the impurities, and then dried it in the oven for a few hours, which left me with this amazing and nearly white crystalline powder. In the end, I managed to make 66.8 grams of the diketal, which corresponds to a whopping 93% yield, and that's just crazy high. I don't remember ever getting a yield so high in any organic chemistry reaction that I have done, so this one is really amazing, it's a good break from all the tar and stuff from the bromination, 
and overall this reaction was on one of the most pleasant from the synthesis so far. As always, I got some of the product into a vial for analysis, leaving me with exactly 66 grams to use for the next reaction, but as I said in the beginning, it will happen in the next video. Ok, so thank you all very much for watching and sticking around to see all the star and me slowly making my way through the cubing synthesis. I hope that you enjoyed this video and if you did you can leave a like and subscribe to my channel. Also stay tuned for the next one in this series because there will be some rather interesting stuff going on in it. Also as always big fans go to my patreons, thank you very much for all your support and making crazy projects like this possible. If someone would also want to support my work and gain access to exclusive content, you can consider becoming a Patreon and see you guys in the next video.